Chapter nine. Let's give it a go. Is the precariat a class? Okay, I, I'll take the introduction then. Okay, in this chapter, we explore the problem of when a category is a class in the case of what, is, what has become to be known as the precariat. The precariat has its origins in discussion of the increase in economic insecurity and precariousness of, un, of employment in the 1980s and 90s. In these earlier works, it was treated mainly as a condition faced by workers rather than as a distinct class within a class structure. This reconceptualization from precarity as a condition to the precariat as a class is much more controversial. We will interrogate the work of Guy Standing, author of The Precariat and The Precariat Charter, its most influential advocate. E.O. Wright will argue that while the precariat can be situated within class analysis, it is not useful to treat it as a distinct class in its own right. So that's the general gist of this chapter. It seems to me like maybe four or five years ago that the, the talk of the precariat was really trendy in the left. Am I right in saying that or has it got a longer history? I mean, you know, there's always like discussions of different like fractions of the proletariat, maybe the lumpen. But like, yeah, precariat, that was very, this is very of its time. It's like, not a lot of people talk about specifically the precariat now. Not anymore. It's, when it was a baby leftist in like 2015, 2016, I remember somebody, I was like, you know, learning socialist theory and stuff. And a friend was like, hey, what do you think about the precariat? Is that, you think it's a class? And I was like, I don't know. What is it? And they, they explained it. And I was like, no, I don't think that's a class. That's basically what this chapter is in a little bit more of a elaborate way. Yeah, I've seen it kind of like come up here and there in the sort of like broader social theory I've run up it run into and in, for my job. So I wouldn't say it's completely gone as a topic of discussion, but it's definitely not like the hot thing in the way that it used to be. Where I see it used, it is usually not considered a distinct like class faction from the proletariat. It's usually like the author's way of saying the contemporary proletariat, which I think is like maybe a more accurate view of what is being discussed there. Yeah, it's it's pretty big though, like, you know, in the way that it, it, it doesn't sort of fit the criteria of class based on exploitation in the way that Eric Holden Wright has advocated in this book, right? So I've seen it also used to just like kind of vaguely gesture in the direction of like, well, you know, things are pretty tough these days. Okay, so like you have people that are, you know, navigating rent markets instead of having being properly uh, yeah. exploited at the point of production. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's just like you could be downwardly mobile middle class, you could be a starving student, you could be, you know, proletarian. They just there's no real distinctions drawn. It's just kind of like, yeah, capitalism is bad and, and people are, are having a tough time. It's kind of a general gist of what I get out of the discussion of it. Yeah, I just thought I'd bring up Betteridge's Law of Headlines. I don't know if you guys uh, know this one. This is like any headline that ends in a question mark can be answered by the word no. Essentially, this is this is what we're going to be finding out today. Okay, well, let's try the next slide. Kyle, how do you think about doing this next slide? All right. Guy Standing's arguments for the precariat as a class. Standing grounds his arguments for the precariat as a class in a quite complex three-dimensional definition of, of class. Damn. It's like seven-dimensional chess over here. Class can be defined as being determined primarily by specific, one, relations of production, two, relations of distribution, and three, relations to the state. From these arises a distinctive, quote unquote, consciousness of desirable reforms and social policies. The explicit inclusion of relations to the state is quite distinctive here. While many class analysts see the relationship of classes to the state as an important issue, few build this into the very definition of class structures. Standing believes that a pivotal aspect of live reality of those in the precariat centers on the increasing marginalization 
of many people from the rights normally associated with citizenship. It is the intersection of economic precarity with political marginality that most sharply creates a boundary dividing the precariat from the quote unquote working class. Yeah, what do we what do people feel about like this dividing of the precariat away from the working class? I mean, it seems it seems well intentioned. Your guy standing around is uh, obviously concerned about the downward mobility of people and wanted to. I don't know if he really thinks that this precariat is a distinct class or not, but it seems like from what is presented in this chapter, there's a lot. Of, it seems to be a lot of well-intentioned concern for people who are in such a precarious situation. And I really think the relations to the state is like a novel part of the definition of a class that I, I kind of like, I don't know how much I agree with, with it or not, but it's, I think it's interesting. It's interesting to think about. Well, it's always implicit if, if you have a theory of like a class state, but yeah. Yeah, I, I guess as far as this is concerned, like it's, you know, one of a series of ways of understanding, you know, why the proletariat don't look like the proletariat. Like, you know, the proletariat in real life don't look like the proletariat from history books or even in, you know, just in history, like the proletariat's always been bigger than semi-skilled infrastructure workers that have, you know, adequate representation. And, you know, I, I don't know, like, I don't want to be too hostile to people trying to, like, figure out the interests of different fractions or whatever. In terms of relations to the state, I especially think it's sort of a... By assigning this to a particular fraction of the proletariat, it's not really grappling with what's happening with democratization in general to, to the greater proletariat and the weakening of democratic bodies in general and, you know, you know, democratic societies, like the way that, leg especially the strict is really visible in the U.S., the way that uh, legislative bodies are kind of getting the shaft for executive bodies. It, so, like, political marginality is, is a, I think, maybe a bigger topic, you know, why like people's relationships to politics and, and state have shifted in a way that I think even if you have formal union representation, like you kind of don't have that much more say in the world. No, unions now basically with few exceptions are There's basically exceptions. like it's a, it's a good it's, it's it gets you a better contract and that's it. Like it doesn't really mean you have a greater say in the economy. Technically, your union money is going to fund a candidate of some kind, but like, does that really get you out of political marginality? No, because these candidates only do like very, tok at best, they do token gestures towards your union and, and that's it. And at worst, they don't they take your money and shaft you anyway. And I think like, it's, yeah, in terms of like, sort of like, citizens' rights, it's sort of like you were saying, like, it's very differentiated between different sectors of the working class like to what extent those rights and their existence or absence is tied to precariousness because like you said like it's like yeah there's a relationship between the sort of disenfranchisement and impoverishment or immiseration of the working class or the shrinking of say the well-off working class but on the other hand for the poorest workers like i don't know if that's the sort of the, the crucial distinction that that would define their condition I, I assume that when he's talking about rights he's talking about sort of you know these like positive liberty liberty like goods provided by the state to to some extent and or provided through the state that is and and i think that uh you know as we sort of talked about in the 18th Vermeer discussion like it's it's kind of a complicated topic in terms of like the relationship between dependence of the state and the working class right and there, there's there's some degree of overlap between the two but I just don't think that, like, you can say, like, you know, the, the healthy working class is the working class that gets the goods from the state unequivocally. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think a bit where he's talking about the rights as well is where he he splits the, we'll see it later, but he splits up the precariat into a number of kind of subcategories, one of which is kind of like, you know, people like, say, in certain European countries like the Roma and that, who really don't get the same rights from the state as the others do, other, yep. other poor workers do. Absolutely, sure. Well, I just wanted to sort of respond to that, that, you know, it's not like the Roma just started existing in 2011. Like, oh yeah, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah, the counter argument because yeah, because there are these people. There's always been these people. This has always been part of a part of the class picture that Mar- that that you know Marxists to varying degrees have participated in locking these people out of the uh, historical subject. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, and you know a lot of this discussion would have been just about, you know, the lumpen at most points in Marxist history. You know, whatever that means to you. <laughs> well, we're going to get to talk about it all over again, folks. Let, let's, let's have a look at this uh, next section here. Guy Standing's arguments for the precariat as a class. Based upon these three dimensions of relations, production, distribution, and relations to the state, which... I'm pretty sure is a form of distribution, but okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I can see how there's other things to it, but like if you're going to talk about economic categories, it's just another type of distribution. But anyway. just remember, it's in the classical Marxist sense, and Marxists kind of suck. So, right? Like, anyway. yeah, yeah, right. Standing identifies seven classes that comprise the class structure of contemporary capitalist societies. Okay, so the seven classes. So number one is the elite or the plutocracy. This is a true ruling class in the classical Marxist sense. In Standing's words, they are not the 1% depicted by the Occupy movement. They are far fewer than that and exercise more power than most people appreciate. So it's, it's not the like quantitative definition of 1%. It is the qualitative definition of like what they say goes. Um, They're the shape-shifting lizard class, essentially. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is like your, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs and Bezoses and so on and so on. Number two is the Salariat. So not the proletariat, the Salariat. This class is defined as those in stable full-time employment, some hoping to move into the elite. The majority just enjoying the trappings of their kind, with their pensions, paid holidays, benefits, often subsidized by the state. Concentrated in large corporations, government agencies, and public administration, including the civil service. So, corpos, basically. Yeah, like corpos or like, what do you call them? I guess you would include what are often called like the liberal elites in 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 this category okay the administrators in 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 public service blue checks in the former sense not the latter sense yeah right (laughs) yeah i mean i think generally speaking the category isn't describing an elite but it's it's like yeah it's it's sort of white collar in either the private or the public sector with salaries and stable forms of like benefits. Um, People during the pandemic that that are just like, well, I'll just work from home. What's the big deal? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who also have salaries? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah the, my friends with salaries are the only people that were like, yeah, this is fine. Fuck it. Who cares? <laughs> yes, the people who were not at risk of dying in the pandemic in right. enormous numbers like, in any way. Yeah. Okay. Number three, the proficients. Ooh. This combines the traditional ideas of professional and technician, but covers those with bundles of skills that they can market, earning high incomes on contract as consultants or independent own account workers. So this would be separate from the salariat in the sense that they are not salaried and they potentially earn more money, but they also don't get a lot of benefits, right? So they're they're just they're just earning the that contract revenue and then uh, paying for their benefits out of pocket or pension out of pocket that kind of thing. I think if you're you know if you want to like 
if you're a Marxist trying to live your values, profession is probably like, you know, shooting for the, like the moon, you know what I mean? Kind of just like make a little extra cream. And uh, yeah, in, you know, neoclassical analysis, you're getting a rent, but uh, fuck them, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, when? yeah. Like, get, get, get that rent, like, get your bread. Yeah. And I like sort of in our discussion that we had previously about the petty bourgeoisie, I think these are the people that I was objecting to calling PB if they don't actually employ anyone uh, themselves. But but um, also, Kyle, as in like that definition of pe petty bourgeois would include people that wouldn't even be proficients because they would be like independent Uber workers and things like that. Yeah, yo, you, yeah, no, 100 percent, 100 percent. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. One um, question: How did how did he come up with the name proficients? Like, it's professional take... plus technician. Oh wow, that's, that's so brilliant! Cool. Some wow. kind of brilliant portmanteau. It's, it is a portmanteau. It's something only an economist yeah. could come up with. I think. Wow! Like, wow. yeah, yes, incredible, truly. Number four: the old quote unquote core working class or the proletariat. This is defined by its reliance on mass labor, reliance on wage income absence of control or ownership of the means of production and habituation to stable labor that corresponds to its skill. Okay. So that is kind of a Marxist like that's sort of. Marxy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's anything really that important about whether you are in this position and make a salary, a wage or a peace wage, but yeah. I think otherwise it basically makes sense uh, to describe what what used to be known as the proletariat. And then number five, we have the precariat, which is a mystery class. Then we have number six, the unemployed, another mystery class. I suppose these are the chronically unemployed is what we're talking about. More so than like just the sort of floating reserve army of labor, like short term unemployment kind of thing. But I'm not who, sure. Because, like, could you really be a class if you're, like, just unemployed for, like, a few months? Well, n no. I, I think Reserve Army of Labor is more precarious. And, yeah. That's, and, yeah, like, if, you, yeah. If, you're permanent, if you're permanently unemployable, then you're underclass. Yeah, you're well, underclass. Well. Well, how, how mm. else are you going to live? Like, what are you going to do? You, you, it's got to come from somewhere. I guess the unemployed are, like, living off of, like, Welfare? Well, how okay, but how, 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 however, comrades, let us pay attention to the definition of the lumpen precariat or underclass. Oh, yeah, lumpen precariat, that's right. <laughs> well, if, if the word lumpen and precariat like, themselves weren't like bad enough separately. Standing specifies this category as, quote, a detached group of socially ill misfits living off the dregs of society. Well, I think you know where we are on this uh, class type. <laughs> Seriously, like, uh, like uh, the reason why there's no, I haven't put any description in for the precariat and unemployed is because neither does it's not in the book. So um, yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 what I figured. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how much standing actually goes into this. If I was a better podcaster, I would have certainly read guy standing or probably gee standing and been like. Oh well, you see, standing really actually makes more of a of a you know thing about blah, 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 blah. his use of unemployed is different than lump and precarity. Actually, that, that's, uh, what, Eric, that's what the panelists are for. God damn it, yeah. that's your job. I know. Sorry, I'm moving. You know, shit. Like Eric Olin Wright actually does do some of that homework for us. If if we're to take him at you know face value and good faith, he says that guy standing doesn't really do much to elaborate on any of these other classes except for the precariat. Mm -hmm. Now, our own right does say, well, the point isn't to, you know, come up with a whole new class typology. The point is to defend the precariat. So, you know, let's see if the argument that distinguishes the precariat from the working class stands, which is what Guy Standing does for most of the book. Yeah. So you're off the hook this time, Esri. Okay. Do you think Olin is his middle name and he just makes sure to say it so he doesn't get confused with Eze? e um, Yes, 100%. Okay. Next question. 
I, I just say, like, I don't particularly like the. I think it's all. Uh, it's it's right who's putting the brackets on the proletariat. The guy describes it all core working class. I'm not exactly sure about that, but I I kind of feel like I hate when people just term like the people that like are the remnants of like a, an organized working class from the past as the proletariat, and not all everybody who's in the same like wage relation with respect to capital. So that's just something I kind of, I don't like. Yeah, it's it's conceptually messy and not like methodologically sound, but it, it's, it's just sort of using this category to point to a sort of like common understanding that has existed in society. And right. to some extent would sort of coincide, I guess, with the idea of like blue collar labor. It also reflects a certain amount of tension between proletariat as an analytical term in a Marxist framework that is a coherent sort of view that you can put on any, you know, capitalist time period and get an understanding out of versus, you know, who like the historical subject was understood to be in the story of the 20th century, long 20th century workers' movement, who they thought the proletariat was during that time, essentially. And so it's a conflict between, you know, analytical reason and a sort of like nominalist, like historicist reason. And most Marxists, you know, specifically the ones that are following Georgi Lukash and kind of consider critique to be their profession, you know, they, they're really taking on this like, nominal like historicist thing as like the Marxist method as like you know more important than communism and you know the ethics behind egalitarianism is this like steadfast you know upholding this method so there are going to be a lot of people who use the proletariat in this sense because you know people have been calling it that for a long time and these people have a are basically just like Euro conservatives with like red flags. So they care a lot more about historic usage than they do analytical usage. I was wondering how we would map these seven classes to these guys. And um, so what do we think? Okay. Now, I like it. Now, uh, dear listeners, we're looking at the seven dwarfs all decked out in a sort of red color. I don't know if the seven dwarfs are normally mostly red, but... They were communists, surprising. famously communist. Yeah, well, yeah, as dwarves. Um, all in, right. In, <laughs> all right, Galaxy Disney, Brain Take. Disney cartoons tend to be. Let's jump in. Let's jump in with the Galaxy Brain Take, all right? Galaxy Brain Take. The elite is not in this picture. The elite is Snow White. Is the queen, like, the feudal aristocracy? The, the evil queen? Yeah, that's, like, yeah. that's, like, the previous class system. Surely the elite are the grumpy. Well, but no, Grumpy's got a pickaxe, though. He's got a union. Well, no, that's that's just for, for hitting people. Uh, <laughs> we got the Solariat is happy. Uh, the proficiency is Doc. The old okay, core working bad. class are bashful. And then we got the precarious are dopey. Uh, <laughs> the, un <laughs> the unemployed I are, are, are sneezy. And we got the lump of proletariat as sleepy. Well, no, no, no. The lumber proletariat doesn't have time to sleep. In fact, if anyone's doing, if anyone's really dopey here, it's the lumber proletariat. Yeah, no, that's real. That's, who's 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 dopey? Who's selling the dope? I mean, if, that's if true. You can, if if you can afford, if, listen, if you can afford to be unemployed as a class status, you're sleepy. Like, yeah, one hundred percent. I'm chilling with raccoons and <laughs> one hundred. If I was, if I could afford to live without working. What would I be doing? I'd be sleeping with, I would be snuggled up with a bunny. Yeah. I'd be snuggled up with a raccoon. I'd be snuggled up with my dog. Yeah. I'd be sleeping right. all fucking day. But, but like the really rich, they, they're never sleepy and content. They're going to be grumpy assholes. No, that's why, guy. that that's why it's Snow White. It's absolutely Snow White. It's like Snow White is like the e-girl Twitch streamer. Yeah. Um, that all their money is going to who's running yeah. society at the top of the aristocracy. Yeah, exactly. It's not Mark Zuckerberg. No, 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 it's no, an no, e-girl. No. no, remember, it's only the visible people are the elites. Like that's right. 
this is this is like an incel version of cost analysis. <laughs> That's what they do. There, there was actually a guy in the first international that was a hard anti-colonialist, but also was basically a proto MRA <laughs> kept trying to do like reverse, like unity theory, Marxist feminism. Oh, wow. Where, you know, the, you know, women are actually the bourgeoisie. <laughs> oh so, my like, that, God. That from Disco Elysium actually has a historical, you know, antecedent. Hilarious. Anyway, I'm putting in my vote for bashful as the elite because it's a long-term sociological fact that class elites develop neuro, like neuroses. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Would Sleepy be one then too? <laughs> just, like... just take taking too many of those sedatives or narcolepsy. Oh, Okay, yeah. The, no, you know what? That might be the salariate, actually. Like, because, like, all my friends with salaries, like... Yeah, they just be napping. They're just fucking cruising. They can just nap through the day. I don't I don't even know when they do work. I don't know what they do. Like, I'm... Well, yeah. they have jobs that are, like, nothing. They're, like, I'm a consultant Jeffrey yeah. Tube analyst. Like, what is... You're just, you're just making excuse, shit up. Excuse me. The consultants are the uh, salariate, not... The uh, salaried, uh, or sorry, not the salaried, the uh, proficients. Yes, those are the consultants. Those are the consultants. Yo, why are why do all these classes sound like aliens from from uh, what's that Starcraft? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> the protons Yo, and the proficients. Yeah, the proficients, the protons. I'm the Zerg, fucking. Oh, that, that's the one thing. <laughs> yeah, the Zerg are the one thing. Yeah. yeah, Zerg are the one thing. <laughs> All right, so this is just giving us a shitty MRA class analysis. Um, nice. Maybe we could make oh, something no, useful no. out of it. Okay, after that uh, very interesting discussion, uh, let's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was really revealing. Uh, let's let's go on and hit the next slide. Esri, how do you feel about hitting this one? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. So, D standings arguments for the precariat as a class. Standing's objective is not to provide careful, analytically rigorous definitions of each of these classes. He provides only a vague set of demarcations and rationales for some of these categories. Uh, for example, it's not at all clear from his analysis how non-managerial white collar and credentialed employees in stable jobs in the state and private sectors should be treated. He's only really concerned with differentiating the, pre the precariat from the rest of the class structure, especially from the working class. He does this by contrasting the working class and the precariat in terms of the three dimensions of class relations. He does not give any explicit ranking to these three dimensions, but the first of these relations of production seems to be the most fundamental in anchoring the concept and giving the concept its name. Right is, isn't right charitable. Couldn't we all learn a little bit from Miracle and right? In his ability to, you know, try to reconstruct something, he doesn't even spend that much time arguing against. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, man. Like, yeah, I, I I don't find his arguments like rights arguments like very like I don't know. I feel like I'm at church a little bit. Like, yeah, like <laughs> like I don't know. It wasn't like a challenging read. I wasn't like, oh man, I don't know. Maybe I have to revise my class analysis. Wright is very fair about presenting Guy Standing's point of view, but he dismisses it rather quickly. I want to flesh out his, you know, critique of it a little bit, but there's almost so little to say. Like, you either accept that this, like, class fraction really does have meaningful, meaningfully different, like, uh, you know, relations of production or, or not. And it's kind of hard. I don't know. Kyle, am I being fair? Like, is this, is this like... It, it, it feels like it? that... It feels like Wright is kind of struggling to see exactly, like, it seems like he's saying he doesn't even define his own terms here. Like, right. He's trying to be nice about it. His yeah. objective is not to make any damn sense. Um, <laughs> what he's trying to do is, yeah. I, I think the thing about, when, when, I was make, when I was making the joke about the e-girl ruling society, I, I, I think the, the, the point there is not that I believe that, obviously, but that this, like, whole thing feels very sort of, like, pointing fingers at things, just sort of like, hey, that's a thing. Like, you know, it's kind of just descriptive and, like, ascriptive to these different groups of, like, yeah, there's, like, seven. I, I came up with a list, 
And am I going to define these in any depth? No, I just I just kind of thought it would it would catch on. Like people might get interested in this sort of journalistic. Well, I feel like when when the precariat sort of first was written, like we looked it up yesterday, it was in twenty eleven, right? So what was going on around this time, right? And you had kind of like the death of class, you know, quote unquote, the death of class debate in in the nineties, which Eric Wright touched on, and then. You had in the two thousands you had Bush and then you had the economic falling out in two thousand eight. And so it feels like around this time class started to be kind of class analysis started to be in vogue again. People were kind of just like looking around being like, Oh shit's fucked up, but it's different than back in the early twentieth century in the heyday of the socialist movement. What's different about it? I don't know. Uh this is a class, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the most terrible read I could give the precariat. Like, mm-hmm. people just kind of look around and be like, shit's different. What's different? Well, I don't know. This is a new class, I guess. Well, the people are grateful when they are employed instead of like, oh, my fucking boss that I totally take for granted at this job, I could get another one of. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. Plus, is, it's like, is... plus, it's like the Occupy movement has just been crushed, right? Right. So, this whole thing about like not being listened to by the state is also pertinent to that moment yeah i forget exactly where the, its publication comes in like the the sequence of events but you know people had signs about precarity and stuff in the movement so it's around it's around this time it, it, all this is kind of happening around the same time and so yeah. this does this chapter really does ground this book in the time that it's published i think that's the most terrible read i could give it the least charitable read I could give it is that it's like those YouTube videos where it's like, oh, there's 42 genders. Based on what? Uh, just, just this. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing a Tumblr post going around saying that there were seven sexes, and I was like, seven. So it's not two, it's, set, set, it's not three, it's seven. Okay, well, yes. I, that, this, this, is what, this is what I was trying to, to, to I think, get at. Is, 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 yeah, it's kind of like a YouTube video or like back when BuzzFeed was a thing, when they used to do lists. Uh, oh, yeah. it's, it's kind of how the, the seven classes feel to me. Do I, do I need to get out the picture of the seven dwarves again and go to which one is which gender? No, you know, we don't. We no. don't need to. No. Okay. We also do not need to. We don't need to discuss the seven sexes because I can't even imagine what that's about. Oh, dear. And to be clear, I do think there are more than two genders, but like to just say like it's, X number. Well, 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 yeah, yeah, no, what's absurd is to fix it instead of to just, like, fall into a sea of infinite variety as the right. limit, like, keeps going up and we approach infinity. Right, right. right. exactly. That's that's more rational. What, yeah. What is that? Is it that slime mold that had 400 genders? Was there a slime mold? Does anyone remember this story? God, Godspeed that you slime mold, like, vanguard of gender. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's wild. That's woke. That is woke. Woke. That's just woke. Oh, God. Slime mold. Uh, The the fucking slime mold's watching the TikTok. Now it's got 400 genders. What is it? Are are we turning turning into the fucking Diet Soul podcast? Okay. Come on, man. Come on, man. All all the money's gone. Like, you know, all the the big leftist influencers. Look, you either got to go right wing or, you know, come on, Twitch streamer. We got to make our pivot somewhere. Come on. Let's get that spiked online money. Like. (laughs) <laughs> we, we can get the, we can get the LaRouche cult money. Come on! All I want like, all I want to say is that cash I, in I, somehow, dude. Like it's getting desperate here. All I want to say is <laughs> I, I want to critique the left from the left, and if that's not okay, I don't know what what's your problem. Okay. <laughs> now, um, Ezri, do you want to take the next slide? You know what? I think that's a fabulous idea. Distinctive relations of production. Standing writes, the precariat consists of people living through insecure jobs interspersed with periods of unemployment or labor force withdrawal and living insecurely with uncertain access to housing and public resources. Standing sees these relations of production as sharply differentiating the precariat from the proletariat. The precariat was no part of the working class or the proletariat. The latter term suggests a society consisting mostly of workers in long-term, stable, fixed-hour jobs, 
with established routes of advancement, subject to unionization and collective agreements, with job titles their fathers and mothers would have understood, facing local employers whose names and features they were familiar with. Whereas the proletarian norm was habituation to stable labor, the precariat is being habituated to unstable labor. He characterizes this core idea of insecurity by arguing that the precariat lacks the seven forms of labor-related security that characterized the working class following World War II. So labor market security or adequate income earning security. Two, employment security or protection against arbitrary dismissal, regulations on hiring and firing, etc. Three, job security, the ability and opportunity to retain a niche in employment. Four, work security, protections against accidents and illness at work. Five, skill reproduction security, opportunity to gain skills through apprenticeships. Six, income security, assurance of adequate stable income. And seven, representation security, possession of a collective voice in the labor market through independent trade unions with a right to strike. The absence of the first five of these forms of security are aspects in the distinctive form of relations of production of the precariat. Yeah, like it's something that I really kind of it drives me mad when I have to read stuff about by, you know, left wingers. A lot of them kind of Keynesian types who kind of think and talk like that the post-World War II pact is the natural state of capitalism. Like that all, a lot of these things here, right. like that define the proletariat are actually the things that were won post-World War II in the class compromise Exactly. It's like how it is so profoundly stupid. It's just like, obviously, the proletariat at one point did not have any of these things and then gained these things and then lost these things again. It's, it's, it's like the idea that like the proletariat came into being after World War II is just so bizarre. I mean, it it, it tracks well, with the definition yeah. that that he uses for the, the the working class or proletariat, but it's very very questionable uh, from any like historical <laughs> standpoint. Well, I think I think that's what we mean when we're like, "Lol, this is so '90s" or something. You know, what the and like the actual content of what we're trying to get at is that, and what we're saying when it's dated and et cetera is like. This is, you know, sort of the shock of recognition, the horror of realization that, hey, um, we're coming out of this like cushy period that is a total anomaly and is not the normal rules of the game. Right. But but I go further than that a bit, uh, Ezri. I'd say I don't even think it's that dated. I'd still say it's dominant, like even on like those people who who like think they are like Marx or stuff like that. Like if you look at the like the popular popularizers like say uh, Richard Wolf or all the MMT people or like left-wing Democrats or left-wing like Corbynites and all that they all talk in this way uh, so I, I, mean, I do, think, do think I think they're really like represent the precariat against the proletariat like what do you what do you no, say no no I mean I mean when they talk of sorry when I talk of the proletariat in these terms you know the working class as is defined of the old working class I I, I think that like this oh, yeah, way of, of describing it is still actually dominant. We're in the minority by, say, pointing out kind of theoretical e stuff here. E even the people that understand the theoretical stuff, when it comes to politics, they just default to the you know ancient historical like way of doing things. This well, part of it is the the crushed horizons of of uh, pro revolutionary communism. Like to them, like well, there's no point in wanting anything more than you know, class compromise, whether they, they realize it or not, that's what they're kind of fighting for. They don't understand how that is an aberration in capitalism, not something that's like really obtainable and sustainable. I, find, I feel like that, you know, the natural state of, of like of the proletariat is to not have any of these things and that we're heading back towards that natural state. That's the way I generally tend to think about it. I don't know if anybody yeah. else disagrees with that. There's a good Stafford Beer diagram that points to, you know, organizations of the bourgeoisie and 
the sc scribbling disorganization of the proletariat, <laughs> uh, which is just a much more accurate view than, well, one party per class, right? And, you know, so each class gets its party and, you know, you, you, okay, the ruling class has its institutions, all right, the working class has its permanent institutions. Yeah. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, we, we have a lot more sort of like proletarian goblin mode in terms of organization that we have this like soccer pitch you know team a red team versus blue team parallelism proletarian goblin mode like it like it Kyle. 